Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our weekly IFT seminar. And today we have one of our own, of our newly again of our own, David Daniel, who rejoined us about a year ago already. And uh, we are very happy, of course, to have him. And then now he will present what he's currently working on and he will discuss the direct detection window to particularly light new physics. David, please. Okay, thank you very much, Sven. And uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, it's really a shame that we'll have to meet virtually like this, but anyway, thank you for uh, having me here. And uh, essentially what I wanted to present, Sven has already advanced that this is more or less in the direction that I'm working on at the moment. And um, it is in particular trying to use direct dark matter detection experiments to explore new physics. And by new physics, I mean here uh, light new physics, but not necessarily only dark matter. Okay, so this is a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, since I'm going to be talking about direct dark matter experiments, I will necessarily have to start by mentioning dark matter, obviously, okay? And I will briefly comment that uh, direct dark matter detection is an excellent probe for new physics. In doing so, I will also mention some of the recent results uh, from Super CDMS, which is the collaboration that I work with. And these are results which are relevant for low mass dark matter searches, okay? Most of what I will be saying though is general, okay? It wouldn't apply only to Super CDMS, but also to other uh, different experimental setups, okay? And in particular, direct detection experiments are going to become so good in the coming decade that they will soon be start seeing other sorts of physics, okay? And in particular, I'm gonna be concentrating here on how dark matter experiments are going to be seeing solar neutrinos. Obviously, if you're an experimentalist looking for dark matter, this is a nightmare because seeing new particles, and in this case, neutrinos, means that you have a new background for your search for dark matter. And normally this is referred to as the neutrino floor for dark matter searches. I'll mention that in the second part of my talk. The neutrino floor means essentially that you're sensitive to uh, standard model neutrinos, but also any contribution on top of standard model. So in particular, I will use it to claim that if we have new physics in the neutrino sector, this neutrino floor can be raised significantly. Again, that would be a problem for direct detection. I will comment on how important supernova constraints are to determine how high the neutrino floor can be, and in doing that, I will also mention some work that I'm currently doing in collaboration with Marina Cermeño, Ángeles Pérez García, and Elliot Reed. The plan was that this paper was out before this talk and I would be able to talk about that, but well, I mean, this always happens, right? This, it is almost finished. Probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, it's almost finished. Um, finally, um, again, since new physics in the neutrino sector can alter the neutrino floor. Another way to see it, probably more positive, is that direct detection experiments can actually constrain new physics in neutrinos. I will give an example of that based on a gauge U1 L mu minus L tau, and I will also comment the relation to the mu anomalous magnetic moment based on a work that I did recently with uh, my PhD student Dorian Amaral, uh, Patrick Foldenauer, and Elliot Reed. Okay, so again, let me start by briefly mentioning dark matter. And well, I think in Madrid, you're in a very good position to look for dark matter because, hey, there's dark matter in Madrid. No surprises there. Okay, Madrid is here, um, eight kiloparsecs from the galactic center. And what you can see here, normally when you talk about dark matter, you show rotation curves of spiral galaxies. Well, the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy and this is the rotation curve of the Milky Way. It is flat toward the outer, toward the outer region, which indicates again the need for dark matter in the outskirts of our own galaxy. But if you also look carefully, and this is a combination of many different searches performed over many decades, um, this also shows and has been shown in, um, well, probably about five, six years ago, that this also shows the needs for dark matter inside our galaxy, okay? Um, again, on the lower plot here, you can see the residuals. Um, again, the good news is that we need, we, we have dark matter. Essentially, there is about 0.3 GeV 
per cubic centimeter of dark matter in the position of the sun um, within the Milky Way. Now, um, although there is substantial motivation for dark matter from the theoretical point of view, there are many ways in which you can realize viable candidates for dark matter. And it is customary to show these candidates on a two by two axis, which is representing the interaction scale on the vertical axis and the typical dark matter mass on the horizontal one. And what I'm showing here is what I think is a theorist paradise because there are again, many different ways in, in which you can realize viable candidates. You can think of the canonical weakly interactive massive particles with, its last, with, with the scattering cross section of the order of the electroweak scale and masses within the GeV, TeV window. But you can also have extremely weakly interacting particles, for example, the gravitino, or very, very light ones, for example, for example action-like particles or ultralight actions, all the way up to uh, even the possibility of dark matter being made of uh, primordial black holes. So although this is a theorist paradise from the experimental, experimental point of view, this is definitely a purgatory because there is no single way of testing all these candidates with one single experimental technique. So normally we resort to different experimental tools to probe different windows of this parameter space. And direct detection experiments are one of those. What do we do with direct detection? Well, essentially we have detectors which are typically kept underground to minimize uh, the background of mainly coming for, for example from atmospheric events or other types of radiation. We are looking for weakly interacting particles in general that traverse the earth and make it to our experiments. This includes neutral candidates but also mainly charged ones and typically we're looking for particles which have a cosmological or astrophysical origin. They also have to be stable enough and again if we are particularly looking for dark matter that is warranted but we can also look for other exotics as, as long as they are stable enough to survive from the moment they are produced until the moment we observe them in our experiment. Interactions are, again, to say the least, very rare. Um, and therefore, our experimental techniques have to include some sort of background attenuation. This is typically why experiments are underground. Um, we also want to maximize the chances of observing something, and this implies increasing the target size as well as increasing the search window, which means, as I will put it in the context of, the, of this talk, looking at lower energy thresholds, in a sense, saving more of the exotic window or of the exotic interaction window. And finally, experiments so use, usually include some sort of background discrimination, background signal discrimination, which may be based on identifying nuclear recoils and electron recoils, studying the morphology of the signal, which in this context means energy spectrum, analyzing the time, de the time dependence. There are experiments that look for modulations, for example, and ideally, although this is not yet realized, looking at the directionality of the signal. The canonical signal that we're looking for, again, if we are thinking of dark matter, is a dark matter particle with a typical velocity of 200 kilometers per second, traversing the earth, making it to our experiments, and colliding with a nucleus inside our detector. The dark matter particle is invisible, so we don't see it coming, we don't see it leaving. The only thing that we see is that the nucleus, initially at rest, gets a recoil energy of the order of the kilo electron volt. Kilo electron volt is simply because that's the energy window that our experiments are ready to observe, okay? Um, if this is the energy that you have available, this means that, again, we are looking at the non-relativistic regime, the particles that we can observe with this technique have a mass typically above one GeV. One can also look for inelastic cross section, okay, but I won't be looking, I won't be concentrating on that here. In the past decade or in past five to six years, it's also been realized that the experiments could also look simultaneously for another source of interactions, which is dark matter or exotic interactions with electrons. The difference here is that electrons are much lighter and therefore, for simple kinematical reasons, they're also sensitive to much lighter dark matter or much lighter exotics. If we're also looking for scattering cross-section, we can access, for example, dark matter masses of the order of the MeV or exotic masses of the order of the MeV. 
But one can, one can even look of, uh, think of, for example, absorption processes, typical of action like particles uh, that could bring down the mass to one, one electron volt or so, okay? The reason for me to mention all of this is that dark matter experiments are becoming much more versatile tests or new, of new physics, okay? Of course, in doing so, many of these dark matter candidates also deviate from the ideal of the canonical weakly interactive massive particles, and we're also proving some sorts of non-canonical ways of producing them, which are often related to also some kind of non-standard cosmology. Okay, so it's actually very interesting, and in doing so, we also we also have some cross correlation with other fields. I mentioned cosmology, and I will also mention it today: neutrino physics. Again, just sticking to the conventional direct detection approach. Um, just for simplicity at the moment, uh, from the numerical point of view, we are interested in seeing how many events, the number of events we have in our experiment. And this is simply integrating the uh, scattering probability given by scattering cross-section here, which contains all the, all the particle physics um, model, if you want, for dark matter. We're integrating this quantity for all the velocities or all the possible velocities of dark matter particles in the, in the Milky Way. And this is encoded in a, a velocity uh, distribution func uh, function and eventually integrating it in a given energy range that our experiment can observe. Scattering cross-section, one can write the most general scattering cross-section. Again, you have to realize that this is in the non-relativistic regime. So one can think, for example, of an effective field theory description for this, uh, which would contain up to 13, 14 different operators. For simplicity, again, it is traditional to consider only two of them, which are the spin independent or operator one in this notation, or and the spin dependent one, which is operator four in this notation. Honestly, at this point, it doesn't matter because we don't have an observation yet. And this actually means that whatever um, analysis we do on experimental data, what we are doing is actually derive upper bounds on any of these 14 different operators. Okay. Again, traditionally, these upper bounds are shown as a function of the spin independent cross section versus mass for simplicity. What else can we do with these experiments? I mentioned before discriminating a dark matter signal and that is mostly done or can be mostly done uh, through the energy spectrum. The spectrum or the energy deposit of a dark matter particle in our detector would follow traditional, typically an exponential signal uh, Consider, for example, here the uh, purple line that would correspond to a 10 GeV WIMP as observed in a germanium target. Um, the horizontal axis corresponds to the recoil energy in KeV, which I mentioned is the typical energy range that we are looking at. If the dark matter mass happens to be larger, this means that we can access uh, more energetic recoils and the spectrum becomes flatter. And on the contrary, if we're looking for lighter dark matter, the spectrum becomes sharper which means that if we want to probe light dark matter, what we need to do is to decrease the experimental threshold. Now, this is the most simplistic case. I mentioned also before that we have other possible effective field theory operators, and some of those could actually give some very different signals. The blue histogram, for example, corresponds to an effective field theory operator, which is momentum dependent. And as you can see here, it would deviate from the canonical exponential um, showing, for example, a peak at the given energy range. This is another reason why going to low threshold is important because it will help us distinguish these, um, let's say, unexpected or different signatures. Um, and hopefully also identify, if we ever see that matter, identify the operator by which it is interacting. Again, um, I don't think this is uh, any kind of spoiler. Okay, we haven't seen dark matter or we haven't found any signal that is has been confirmed for dark matter. And therefore what we do is derive upper bounds on the scattering cross section as a function of the mass. In the large energy window, uh, liquid novel gas experiments based on xenon and argon are leading the game. And in particular, xenon experiments, LUX, xenon one ton and Panda X have been able to rule out regions of the parameter space with a scattering cross section of both 10 to the minus 46 centimeters square. Notice here the range of masses essentially starts at 50 GeV onwards. 
what happens at low ma lower masses? Well, at lower masses, you have smaller experiments, but which are, but which are much more sensitive. I'm mentioning here some of those, the whole family of super CDMS based experiments together with Edelweiss and CDX, which are germanium based. based. Um, some other experiments such as Crest, NewsG, etc., which complete the search for lower masses. In particular, um, only a few months ago, Super CDMS released some um, data for nuclear recoils, a nuclear recoil search that we carried out in Slack in 2018 um, with a very small experiment, actually. This is a silicon strip, a silicon detector, uh, which as you can see here, um, the dimensions are really, really tiny. This is 3.8 centimeter by one millimeter thickness. And the reason why this kind of searches is important is not because you have a large volume of target, but because it is extremely sensitive. And actually the resolution is super, super small. So you can see here that the threshold is of the order of the electron volt, beaten by three orders of magnitude liquid noble gas experiments. And the resolution is also of the order of the electron volt. Now, what this allows, again, is to look for dark matters, dark matter scattering, which are very, uh, which are not very energetic. And the results from this search, okay, which have been interpreted only as an upper bound, can be shown here in this red line, which is consistent with previous results, for example, by, by the Crest collaboration. And it beats our, some of our results previously of CDMS light, okay? Again, bringing down the mass of the dark matter or the, the bound and the mass of the dark matter down to 10 to the minus one GeV. This search is again based only on nuclear recoils, but as I mentioned before, we can complete this by looking at electron recoils. And this is also what we've, got, what we've done with a very similar type of detectors, okay? These detectors are instrumented in such a way that the voltage difference is very high. And this triggers the, um, essentially, it, 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 it makes us be more sensitive to the phonons which are released by the primary interaction of dark matter, okay? Again, um, this is another uh, centimeter scale experiment. This is a square of centimeter, it's a, it's a square centimeter by half a centimeter thickness. The total exposure is almost ridiculous if you compare it to xenon-like experiments. This is 1.2 gram per day. When xenon-like experiments are looking at ton scale per day. But again, the threshold is of the order of the uh, electron volt. This means that we can see single electron hole per production. This is a semiconductor. So we can see the production of single electron hole pairs. Uh, remember that the gap in silicon and germanium is typically of the order of the three electron volt. So that's effectively our threshold. These are the results that we can see here. Uh, this is the number of events as a function of the recoil energy in electron volts. The different peaks correspond to the activation of single electron hole pairs. The energy that you see here, typically you would see three electron volts, but the voltage is different that we're putting in this crystal is 100 electron volts. So that's why you can see here that the energy of this excitation so to be is 100 electron volts. The signal that one would expect from dark matter is the black, um, the black line. The background, which is dominated by um, some kind of um, probably infrared photons, which are giving us uh, a fraction of the electron hole pair energy. Um, well, is, is here the red line. And again, what we do is we interpret this as an upper bound on the scattering cross section. If we interpret this as elastic scattering, uh, we can put bounds on models for which the ele uh, electron scattering, dark matter electron scattering is of the, of the 10 to the minus 33 centimeter square. This will correspond to this blue line here, and it extends down to masses of the order of the MeV. This is comparable to other experiments, uh, which are essentially using the same technique. Damig is probably the, uh, the most interesting one, uh, which is also, also has a Spanish collaboration in the IFCA in Santander. We can also interpret this as uh, absorption, some kind of dark photon or action like particle model. And then the same kind of search would be interpreted as an upper bound um, on the, for example, in the case of dark photon, you could uh, put an upper bound on the coupling of the dark photon to the ordinary photon, the kinetic mixing. 
um, which would allow you to bring this down to masses of the order of the electron volt. Very good. So this, in my opinion, paints a very interesting um, picture for the next, for the coming years, okay? It tells us that we have the technique to go down not only in cross section, but also in mass, accessing new regions of the parameter space. And this is why we're all very excited that in the coming years, all this area of the parameter space that we have been able to probe again in understood that the scattering cross section as a function of the mass will be brought down by many order or by various orders of magnitude. Now this comes at a cost and that's why I have here this big sign of danger here uh, for this complete orange, sorry, yellow line. At some point, our experiments are going to be so sensitive that we are going to be able to test a new type of background. And this is due to the scattering of neutrinos in our detector. So it turns out that neutrinos can be observed in direct detection experiments. Again, these experiments are not designed to do so, but we are becoming very sensitive. The neutrinos can interact with the electrons in our detector, either by the neutral or the charged current, exchanging Z or W bosons. But we can also look at a very exotic uh, phenomenon, which is the scattering, the coherent scattering of neutrinos with nuclei. The equivalent wavelength for a neutrino with an energy of order of the MeV is about the size of the, of the nucleus, it's of the order of the femtometer. So there is a chance that neutrinos interact coherently with the whole nucleus. Now this is exactly the same signal that we're looking for in dark matter. And this is why this process, even if it is very insignificant, worries us because it would be indistinguish indistinguishable from dark matter interactions. Um, so far, I'm only talking about the standard model process. So calculating the probability of this process is very easy. We just have to integrate again the cross section of neutrinos interacting either with electrons or with nuclei times the flux of neutrinos. Uh, I will mention about the flux in a minute, integrating it to the total energy that we are looking at in our experiments. This equation is completely analogous to the one that I showed before for dark matter. The only thing that I'm taking into account now again is that I can scatter off electrons or nuclei. The neutrino electron scattering is here. Uh, no surprises. This is just standard model physics. And um, we don't have any free parameters. Okay, this is just essentially uh, probably the living uncertainty here is actually in the solar fluxes or in the atmospheric fluxes. We can make a prediction for this quantity. Likewise, we can make a prediction for how, how large is the coherent neutrino nucleus scattering because there's no input here that we don't know. In particular, there is a form factor that parameterizes the loss of coherence at large energy, but this is exactly the same form factor that we would find for dark matter interactions. So again, the spectrum might be very, very similar. So which neutrinos can we see in dark matter experiments? Well, this is a zoom of the neutrino flux in the MeV scale. At lower energies, we have the very abundant, but um, solar neutrinos, which come with a small energy, okay? PP neutrinos are the most energy, uh, the least energetic one, even though they are the most abundant. Boronate neutrinos, on the contrary, will have energies up to 10 MeV or so. Um, so typically, again, since we're going to be limited by threshold, boronate neutrinos are the ones that we are first going to see. There's a very interesting population of neutrinos, which are the so-called neutrinos from the CNO cycle, whose flux or, yeah, the flux would be related to the solar metallicity. So there's actually a lot of interest in analyzing them. I would have said observing them, but finally Boroxino had conclusive evidence that we have observed CNO neutrinos. There's still the question on whether we are living in a high metallicity or low metallicity sun, which has consequences in fixing, for example, some, um, anomalies that we've seen or incompatibilities of solar models with helioseismology data. So there's still a lot of interest in getting down to CNO neutrinos. However, direct detection experiments might not be the way. And then finally, atmospheric neutrinos are at the highest energy, uh, but as you can see here, many orders of magnitude below in abundance or in flux. I'm superimposing here in blue, the type of, or the neutrino flux that would be uh, observable in xenon-like experiments, if we consider, for example, threshold of the, of the order of three, 3 keV or so, which are typical in these experiments. 
as you can see, xenon-like experiments are mostly sensitive to atmospheric neutrinos, whereas super CDMS in nuclear recoils can actually start probing boronate neutrinos. So again, even though we have a lower mass, a lower target mass, we can observe this very interesting population of neutrinos. Now, if we're looking at electron recoils, however, all of the dark matter experiments would be sensitive to all the fluxes. Now, since proton, since PP neutrinos are the most abundant by far, that means that essentially what we are observing are PP neutrinos. Okay. Now, what do we do with that information? Well, um, the first thing that we have to see is how would we see these neutrinos in the dark matter experiment? Uh, this is the this is the spectrum that we would observe. Essentially, the only thing that I've done is taking these fluxes, integrating them for a dark matter experiment based on germanium. And again, as a function of the recoil energy, PP neutrinos are at low energy. But again, uh, you would need a recoil energy, probably electron volt scale, which is difficult to achieve. CNO neutrinos are somewhere here, very hidden, and boronate neutrinos are here, okay? Why is this a problem? If I superimpose here the signal that we expect for dark matter, it mimics completely the signal that we have for boronate neutrinos. Of course, this only happens for a typical dark matter mass of 6 GeV and a scattering cross section, which is uh, 10 to the minus 45 centimeters square. But this means that it would be this difficult to distinguish these signals. Also, if dark matter mass happened to be heavier, it might also be difficult to disentangle it from atmospheric neutrinos, as I'm showing here. And this is the reason for the neutrino floor. What this means is that direct, direct dark matter experiments are going to be able, are not going to be able, well, are going to have difficulties in disentangling dark matter neutrinos below this or in this um, yellow area. Okay. There are ways to go below the neutrino floor. So reaching the neutrino floor is not the end of the world. One can do spectral analysis, annual modulation, combine different targets, or even if we finally get to have this big directional detection experiments, we can also look at directional detection because we would expect that solar neutrinos come from the sun and dark matter is more isotropically um, distributed. But this also raises the question is how well have we est uh, established the height of the neutrino floor. As I mentioned before, if we're talking about standard model physics, the height of the neutrino floor is quite well uh, predicted, okay? It's, we don't have any free parameters. And the only thing that we have is about a 7% uncertainty in the flux of boronate neutrinos, but that's it. However, we can also have new physics, the neutrino sector that would probably, or that could potentially raise the neutrino floor. So for the second part of my talk, I'm going to be concentrating on how, how is actually the neutrino floor. And the idea is this, okay, I'm actually showing our, uh, this was the dog that was that we used to have in the IPPP, okay, her name is Emmy. And um, I mean, the idea is simply that, no, okay, that the neutrino floor could be raised by some type of new interaction, okay? We're not looking for a dog, but in this case, for a kind of set prime or scalar particle or anything between the neutrinos and the uh, rest of the standard model particles. So for simplicity, let me consider a um, simplified kind of model in which neutrinos feel some new type of scalar particle. Um, and this would be a scattering either of electrons or quarks, for example. This could give an extra boost to electron recoils or to nuclear recoils. So I'm showing on the left-hand side how would a germanium experiment see these new type of interactions? The dashed line in black on the left plot corresponds to the standard model prediction for the electron, for the number of electron recoils expected in germanium. And the different color lines correspond to how this prediction is enhanced by the presence of a new scalar particle. Of course, if the scalar particle is very light, the prediction becomes much larger. And you can see here the order of magnitude of the mass that would give you a, a sizable increase, okay? We're talking masses of the order of the MEV. Likewise, one can also look for new physics in nuclear recoils. This plot here is a bit more complicated, but I'm going to ask you to concentrate on the red line, which is the one that corresponds to germanium experiments. 
the solid line corresponds to the standard model prediction and the dashed line, which increases quite radically below, below uh, energy scales of the order of the 10 to the minus one kilo electron volts, corresponds to the new physics contribution from a one keV or one MeV light mediator. The rest of the lines correspond to different targets. And this was only to show that there's also some target dependence here, which is interesting if you want to combine experimental data from future experiments. The reason I'm showing these plots is again to show that the standard model prediction for the scattering cross section of neutrinos with electrons or nuclei can be significantly altered if we consider light, light mediators. And a similar thing happens if you consider um, a light cage boson, for example, a set prime. Now, obviously, dark matter experiments are not the only ones looking for physics in the neutrino sector. And in particular, there are dedicated neutrino experiments that do this much better. Um, we have, for example, bounds from neutrino stable beta decay, bounds that come from um, meson decays, um, or Xeno in particular also has bounds on the coupling of neutrinos to any other type of new physics. And at low masses, we also have constraints from cosmology, in particular, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom that we have a big one nucleosynthesis, uh, put a lower bound on the mass of the mediator of the order of the, of the MeV or so. All these constraints are represented here by a gray area. I would like to bring your attention to a new type of bound uh, that I'm putting in this plot that corresponds to the coherent experiment. When I introduced coherent neutrino scattering before, I should have said that that standard model process had not been observed until very recently, where the coherent collaboration, which is a good name for a collaboration, observed this event in the spallation facility um, simply because the flux of neutrinos was very large. Okay, well, and also they had a very good experimental setup. Coherent, um, the coherent observation is, co is consistent with the standard model prediction. And then again, this allows us to put bounds on any type of new physics. And the coherent constraint is actually leading over some of these other experiments that I just mentioned before, okay? This, this dash line that then becomes solid here. So in principle, if we wanted to see what is the maximum coupling that we can have as a function of the mass, we could draw this solid line here and try to calculate the neutrino floor for this line, okay? If we did that, we would see that the standard model neutrino floor, which is in this plot represented by the dotted line, can be increased by about five orders of magnitude at low mass. This is the neutrino floor. This should be yellow below if, to be consistent with the previous plot. And the neutrino standard model neutrino floor changes from 10 to the minus 43 centimeter square to something of the order of 10 to the minus 38 centimeter square for a germanium detector for a xenon detector or for a helium detector on the left-hand side. This is a spectacular increase. It means that if we're looking for dark matter, especially in the light mass window, we cannot be certain that we have observed dark matter within a large area of the parameter space. I'm superimposing here in red, the expectation for super CDMS high voltage, sensitivity that we're going to reach in the coming years, and as you can see here, it, it's this, it, it probes this region um, at least down to masses of the order of the GeV or so. And something very similar happens to xenon-like experiments, even if they cannot probe a significant part of the, dark, of the low mass parameter, they're seen, they're, they might be sensitive to boron and neutrinos, only the end of that spectrum. And they can also be sensitive to an increase of the neutrino floor of about a factor, as you can see here, uh, 100 or so. So actually determining how, the, how high this neutrino floor is, is extremely important to interpret future, future results from the detection properly. Now, if, I, if you allow me to go back to the previous plot, there is a bound that I didn't mention, which is this dotted uh, green line. And this dotted green line comes from constraints on the neutrino diffusion in supernovae. Particular, this bound comes from an analysis of uh, Jasamon Farsan in uh, 2000 and collaborators in 2018, where they estimated the contribution of new physics to the standard model one and how this could affect 
the neutrinos or the timing of neutrinos that we observed from the supernova in 1987-8. There were some simplifications done in their analysis, and in particular, the only thing they did was comparing when the standard model prediction was equal to the new physics prediction. And they didn't incorporate any, um, any details about the Majorana or Dirac nature of neutrinos. And in particular, in my opinion, something even more important is that they didn't take into account any medium effects when, uh, when doing this calculation. Okay, in particular, they didn't calculate the neutrino mean free path in the supernova. So this is something that we are actually uh, now recalculating because if this bound was real, it means that the neutrino floor could be, I mean, the increase in the neutrino floor that I mentioned before could be reduced, in particular by about one order of magnitude as I'm showing here in these lines. So a work that I'm doing in collaboration with uh, Marina Cermeño, Ángeles Pérez García and Elliot Reed is re-examining this supernova neutrino bound. What we're doing is considering again, we don't have a vast amount of data from uh, supernova neutrinos, but we do have the observation of supernovae 1987a, we suggest that neutrinos are observed for a window of about 10 seconds. So during the final phases of core collapse supernovae and after the initial burst of neutrinos, which you can see here at time, essentially time equals zero, neutrinos are still trapped within the proton neutron star, which has a radius of about 10 to 15 kilo, uh, kilometers. And they are emitted as the proton neutron star cools down. Okay, so what we are seeing here are neutrinos, which comes comes from this cooling down, the so-called Kevin Helmholtz uh, phase. This observation is of course consistent with standard model neutrinos, but new physics contribution can alter the neutrino mean free path. In particular, new interactions in neutrinos can, make, can mean that neutrinos are trapped for longer, and therefore it would be inconsistent with this observation of 10 seconds. The problem here is that obviously for to do this properly, um, in principle, you would need to do a simulation of physics in, or neutrino physics in the supernovae, okay? And we are not able to do that. What we've done is taken uh, data from um, observations that exist in the literature. And in particular, I'm showing here uh, the results from an analysis of uh, uh, Fisher and collaborators in 2012, where they show the temperature, for example, and uh, density of a proton neutron star shortly after collapse, okay? So this, you can see here the temperature for one second, five seconds or 20 seconds post bounce, okay? This is after, after supernova collapse. And uh, again, the density, which I have compared with the nuclear density here, uh, the nuclear saturation density, which is about two times 10 to the 14 gram per centimeter per cubic centimeter. So what you can see here is that the core of the proton neutron star has a density which is very large. And this means that medium effects cannot be ignored in the calculation of the neutrino mean free, path, mean free path. We have not incorporated the time dependence. We have considered only uh, the solution at five seconds. And we have taken three slices or spherical shells in the proton neutron star with a temperature of 25, 32, and six uh, MeV. And the densities that you can see in this plot. What we have done then is to compute the uh, neutrino mean free path and uh, again put an upper bound on uh, the amount of time that neutrinos have to be or can be trapped inside the proton neutron star. The results that I'm showing here on the right hand side correspond to, a, to an analysis by uh, Radian collaborators in 1997. These are, this is only standard model physics, okay, and it shows that neutrinos, the, the main contribution within the standard model would be neutrino interactions with nuclear, uh, with neutrons, okay? We're working here with a lepton number violating model. And this means that we don't have, in principle, we are not going to have this interaction. For us, the typical, the, the main interaction is going to be neutrino nuclear, uh, neutron, okay? We can ignore neutrino protons or neutrino electron interactions simply because there are uh, fewer of them, okay? And I mean, just visually, the window of the parameter space that we have to play with is this uh, blue square, okay? Again, one has to be much more careful because this depends on the uh, nuclear, on the, on the baryon density that you have inside the, inside the proton neutron star, okay? But eventually what we're asking 
is that the new physics contribution doesn't mean that the lambda uh, decreases below something of the order of 10 to the minus two meters. Well, just for, uh, mm, yeah, just for illustration, here is the scattering cross section that we are taking. But again, this is a scattering cross section of neutrinos with, nuclear, uh, with, uh, with neutrons. And uh, we, have we have computed the neutrino mean free path for each of these spherical shells. Okay, and essentially the diffusion time, we have considered it the addition of the three diffusion times. Our preliminary results suggest that Majorana neutrinos are slightly less constrained than Dirac ones. The difference is simply the chemical potential of neutrinos inside the proton neutron star. Because for Majorana neutrinos, the chemical potential would be vanishing. And this implies a difference in the neutrino energy and eventually also a difference in the calculated cross section. So preliminary, and I'm sorry that I don't have the final line to show here, but this our preliminary result suggests that the previous bound from supernovae uh, diffusion or from neutrino diffusion in supernovae would not apply. And in principle, we would have, we would confirm that increase of uh, about five orders of magnitude for uh, small masses in the neutrino flora. Again, I hope that we can see this paper anytime soon. What this means, and I think it's important, is that any statistical or machine learning tool, which we are looking at at the moment, to discriminate dark matter from neutrinos must be set in place now. We cannot wait until the area that we thought corresponded to the standard model. This also means that dark matter experiments can probe new neutrino physics. And this is something that I would like to concentrate on for the last 10 minutes or so. So dark matter experiments can probe new physics, and this is obvious from the previous results. Now, can we actually apply this to any a scenario that is interesting? Well, just for illustration, we have considered an L mu minus L tau, U1 L, U, U1 L mu minus L tau model. Um, the reason is that this is a minimal kind of model, which is anomaly free, simply because we're gauging the difference between two lepton number, two lepton flavor numbers. There's no need for extra fermions. So the construction is actually quite simplistic. In this model, we have a new um, hidden photon, which is massive, um, gets a kinetic coupling to the standard model photon. And then we can write the interactions in terms of the hidden photon as follows. Okay, So in particular, we're calling the hidden photon A prime. And we can calculate the coupling to each pair of fermion anti-fermion. And what we see is that although it has three level couplings to the muon and tau sector, the coupling to electrons and quarks only happens at loop level, which means that they are very suppressed and this model can avoid experimental constraints quite efficiently. This is interesting if you're looking for, if you're trying to play um, within a larger window of the parameter space, obviously, okay? Another reason why this model is very interesting and has been revived lately is because it can give a contribution to the mean anomalous magnetic moment. Um, in particular, through this kind of loop here, where you're exchanging this new hidden photon, okay? It would be the equivalent of a set prime, a very, very small mass set, set prime, okay? Again, we are awaiting still confirma experimental confirmation for G minus two, and this may actually happen in the coming months, okay? So, I don't know, this is actually very exciting. This model was also interesting and it was pointed out in this paper by Nicolas Bernal and collaborator about a um, couple of years ago, because it could significantly alleviate and observe three sigma deviation for uh, the local measurements of the Hubble parameter from the value that you infer from CMB data. Now, again, this um, mismatch is still disputed and it might not be there, but if it was there, it would suggest that the number of relativistic, extra relativistic degrees of freedom would be a further 0.4 ex expressed in terms of an effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom. This means that you have room for new light particles at BBN. And it also points to light particles, okay, to light mediators. So in the parameter space of the coupling, remember that we only have one coupling in this model, which is the G mu minus G mu tau as a function of the mass of the mediator, which I'm expressing here in GEV, there is a sweet spot that I'm pointing, that I'm showing here in red, that would sim uh, simultaneously explain the G minus two anomaly, which is the green band in this plot, and the observed 
deviation for uh, the Hubble parameter. Even if you forget about the Hubble parameter, you have a wind of the parameter space that could account for G minus two observation. Again, the rest of the experimental bounds at high energy from colliders, uh, at lower energies from neutrino experiments. Again, I'm showing here the coherent result just because it is new. We recalculated it for liquid argon and I think it's interesting. And um, the constraint on the number of effective degrees of freedom from, CB, from CMB is parallel to this one because essentially it's just counting degrees of freedom. So how do direct dark matter experiments come into play here? Well, this yellow line for xenon one ton already gives you a hint. This is based on the latest result for electron recoils observed by xenon one ton, the one that potentially showed an increased. We interpret it in terms of an upper bound. This is what you get, okay? So it is already starting to be competitive with the rest of the experiments in this parameter space. Um, I've mentioned very quickly uh, Borexino. Again, I mean, you can play the similar game, okay? Borexino has measured the neutrino spectrum with great precision, especially the beryllium seven flux, which is this red line here that extends to larger um, energies. So Borexino can be used to determine bounds on the neutrino electron coupling, which is what we've done in the previous play, in the previous um, plot. In our paper, we've also re-evaluated bounds from the coherent experiment using cesium iodine and liquid argon targets. And both observations are consistent with the standard model. Xenon one ton once more, even though it is very tempting to, 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 to interpret this as an excess, we only use this to put upper bounds on the scattering cross section from something exotic. For example, here, um, um, we're showing a point, benchmark point two that would be excluded and that would be the dashed blue line. And finally, to show the potential of new next, next generation direct dark matter detection experiments, we've considered germanium based experiments motivated by super CDMS or future versions of super CDMS. One of them looking for electron recoils and another one looking for nuclear recoils. For this particular experimental setup, we are using projected background models. And we're also looking uh, at xenon experiments for which we assume that they are going to be background free because it is quite, uh, in the case of nuclear recoils, okay? For electron recoils, we're assuming the background of the, of the projected experiment. What we've done is essentially computing how many neutrinos we would expect given this new parameter of new physics. And we've computed electron recoils on the left, nuclear recoils on the right, and then the combination of nuclear and electron recoils. And with this, we have set upper bounds for argon and xenon experiments, as well as germanium one. The bottom line here, I don't want to go into too many details, but germanium-based experiments on the right-hand side are the most effective ones to probe nuclear recoils. Again, simply because the threshold is much smaller. But if you have a big experiment that can look for electron recoils, and that would be a xenon one in cyan, uh, you would be eating up much more, many more regions of the parameter space. So once we combine all of these searches, this is a um, blow up of the region of the parameter space that satisfies the G minus two and the, um, well, if you want the, 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 the observation on the Hubble parameter. And you can see here the predictions for super CDMS in red, dark side in purple, LC, which is a future xenon experiment, and Darwin, that would be a massive multi-ton experiment, okay? So what this is telling us is that xenon experiments through electron recoils are the optimal experimental setup to look for confirmation of this coincidence or this type of new physics. That LC within the next five to six years would be able to prove this particular area of the parameter space, which is very interesting. And that a future multi-ton experiment such as Darwin, we are looking here at the time scale of 20 years, would be able to probe almost virtually all the area of the parameter space that would be consistent with G minus two. Simultaneously, and for um, comparison, we are showing what coherent could, would be able to do in the future. And what, for example, NA62 in the decay of chaos could also probe in the coming years. 
So it's inter interesting that we're probing similar areas of the parameter space. So with this, let me finish here. Um, I think my main objective with this, apart from saying hello to all of you and all of that, um, was to show that direct dark matter detectors are, like, are excellent probes for light invisible sectors, be it dark matter or neutrinos. On the one hand, this is a nightmare if you're looking for dark matter, because this means a neutrino floor at low masses. That, as I've shown, uh, is dependent on supernova constraints that we are evaluating at the moment. This means that we need to develop tools to discriminate neutrinos and dark matter earlier than, we, earlier than expected. And finally, xenon-based experiments can also probe interesting parameter spaces for models through electron recoils. I showed the very interesting case of the U1 L mu minus L tau. Okay, so let me finish here. Um, thanks very much for your time. Thanks a lot, David, for this, uh, as usual, very nice and interesting talk. Are there questions or comments? Enrique? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you <laughs> for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I think if you have, uh, if you introduce these, these large uh, contributions to scattering of neutrinos with either electrons or, or nuclei, this would also have an impact in, uh, in neutrino oscillations as non-standard matter effects, what they call non-standard interactions. I don't know if you have considered it. Since I saw Pedro Machado among the authors, I would expect so. <laughs> yes, I mean, you can you can rewrite our interaction in terms of non uh, non standard interactions if you want. So the language is just different that I use here, but it's the same type of ones that we're looking at. But don't you have significant constraints from oscillation data? I think there's uh, everything that. All the constraints that there are, I think, are in this are in this type of plots. Okay, so I believe that yeah, that's why I was asking because I was surprised there is nothing on. Okay, it's true that uh, in oscillations the constraints will be flavor dependent because mm. it's what we are trying to see in oscillations the flavor change. Uh, so probably it's difficult to translate into the same plot, but that should be significant. Not, yeah, I don't think it is that difficult, but notice that we are looking here at a very small value of the couplings, okay? It is true that you have those constraints. But the mediator is very light also, no? well, not, not that light. Yeah, okay, it's not that, that light, okay. Yeah, probably, probably they are not competitive. Like, I, I would have to, to do the estimate. Um, I don't think they are, um, okay. I. I'm quite convinced that they are not in the wide area here, for sure. I wouldn't be able to tell you where exactly they lie here or how far they are from, from this, but notice that the coupling here is quite small. And that's also what yeah, we're, no, we're looking true. now at the, Sorry. You know, yeah, you are right, you are right. You no, know, I, I, I had in mind even lighter mediators maybe, but... Lighter mediators, the problem is that you start... Yeah, no, no, I mean, I know, I, 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 I did not remember the plot. <laughs> so uh, when I asked the question, I, I thought you, you were considering lighter mediators, but no, now that I see it, probably it's not so competitive after all yet. Because compared to, to G Fermi, uh, then the other hand, you have a significant enhancement with respect to the standard interaction, so... Uh, it's not that big, okay? Notice, for example, I think a way, a way for you to, 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 to see where the standard model interaction would lie is the way that uh, Jasaman Farsam drew this line, okay? This is where the contributions of new physics equals that of standard model. Okay. Okay, so the bounds are more or less around there from oscillations because, exactly. yeah, well, uh, for some flavors it's smaller, for some flavors it's stronger, yeah. but they are that order of magnitude. Okay, so I think this, this gives you a visual cue of where they would lie, okay? And then depending on the experimental technique, you're actually probing different energies and that's where the different mass of the mediator comes in. So this is also, similar to that you're doing in coherence, for example, okay? Only coherence is not that sensitive, it's not that precise. Yeah, also the ones I was thinking as, as I was speaking, <laughs> the, the ones from oscillations you can evade. For instance, probably you can, Put very string. I mean, 
you can put certainly very strong constraints in the ones that are flavor of diagonal, but you can always go flavor diagonal. And even there are strong constraints in the flavor diagonal, but there is a degeneracy because you are only sensitive to the differences between the new mu, I mean, the, the, the scattering of new mu's or the scattering of new tau's minus the one of new is. Because hmm. you always, uh, uh, I mean, something that is constant to all flavors factors out of the Schrodinger equation and does not contribute to, to oscillation. So you could have these interactions as large as you want, as long as they are flavor universal and then there are no constraints from oscillations. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the work that we did on the U1 L mu minus L tau, we had to be a bit more careful about that and we did include, uh, uh, sorry, I mean this, uh, But yeah, I mean, we didn't, as far as I know, we didn't miss any of those of those bands, okay? But I would like to see, maybe we can talk later and see if there's anything that we, uh, that might be interesting to look at there. Well, if you had, uh, if you were discussing with Pedro, Pedro knows everything about this, so I'm sorry. <laughs> he, he considered it, I was just curious. And you mentioned also the difference uh, in the supernova constraints very fast. Uh, coming from where neutrinos were Dirac or Majoran. Would that imply that you can somehow test the Majorana nature of neutrinos from uh, the, the, the difference? Supernova? See, the thing is that here we are limited by what we can do, okay? Uh, I mean, what we can do physically, we, we cannot, we, have, we, we are not able, or the group of people that I'm working with, we are, we are not able to run a simulation for supernovae, okay? So we're relying on data that some other people have run for us. The difference here is some of the parameters that we run there, for example, the chemical potential of the neutrinos. Uh, for Majorana neutrinos, you have chemical potential. The chemical potential would vanish, okay? This means a different energy for neutrinos, and this is a change in the resultant scattering cross-section. The difference that we've seen is very small. And the data that you have from supernovae is also quite... Um, you know, it is what it is. You would have to wait for a new supernova. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but in principle, in principle, yes. I mean, the, a different chemical potential would mean, and a different uh, distribution of neutrino energies throughout the proton-neutron star would mean a different diffusion time, if you want, which is the observable that we are comparing with. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I was not aware of it. Uh, I, I mean, in the, end, in the end, the differences are very small, okay? Yeah, no, I can imagine, but uh, we have much larger detectors than we did <laughs> in 1987. Yeah. So the statistics would be much larger and energy resolution and so on. So to know. give you an idea, for example, the difference in the in the diffusion time that we've observed is of the order of, well, it's smaller than 10%. I don't know. Maybe it's worth looking into. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe there's something interesting there, okay? But again, notice that the way that we've computed the diffusion time is rough, okay? Yeah, no, I mean, one would have to do a, a very thorough thing, but maybe discussing with, with the experts, I mean... I mean, if you could convince someone to have a relation for Majorana neutrinos, that would be awesome. Mm. Because that's what we're missing here. I mean, neutrino is now a bit of a case where one hopes to see this and it's not easy. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is super interesting, honestly. I mean, they, um, we, our only objective was just trying to see whether that line was a little bit far, uh, below or, or above, but this is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, but maybe it's worth discussing with, with the people that are doing these simulations to see. <laughs> Definitely. So we have discovered a new method to determine the Majorana nature of neutrinos. I think this uh, seminar was a really big success. <laughs> Are there other questions or comments for David? I have a question actually. Yes, Pilar, please go ahead. Hi, David, nice talk, very nice talk. Um, so maybe you said this and I missed it, but at the end of the talk, in the last part, you consider this L mu minus L tau model, right? Yeah. 
Uh, so did you think about other models or, or were you particularly interested in this one and you did not consider any other uh, flavored gauge models? Depends for what, okay. We considered other models for constraining them with the right detection or equivalently to claim that we can probe new physics, okay? But the reason why I thought this one was interesting was G minus two. Okay. Okay. In, in, in other models, otherwise, I mean, the only thing that changes is that this, or the main thing that changes just to, is that this coupling would be similar in order of magnitude to the coupling of two electrons. So what that means is that some of these bounds are actually lower than this one, okay? So you're looking at 10 bounds of the order of 10 to the minus four. So that's why we consider L mu minus L tau is because it saved us a significant chunk of the parameter space that could allow for the explanation of G minus two. Okay. Okay, so you were interested because of this G minus two thing. It's only because of G minus two. Okay. And we did it quickly because we thought we were promised that G minus two would come out in January or so. <laughs> January last year, probably, yeah. <laughs> we thought it was coming up this year, last year, so yeah. yeah. Um, I have one question on this here. Um, let's assume we get the new result and uh, it moves closer to the standard model, something yeah, that happens with many anomalies. How yeah. would the green band shift? So if imagine that the new result says that it is consistent with the standard model, the only thing that happens is that this green band becomes an upper bound on new physics. Mm -hmm. So it would melt with the gray area here. Sorry, you cannot see my pointer now. Um, oh, okay. It would blend in with the rest of the constraints. Imagine, for example, that you put a bound on the central value of this. Okay, so all of these would be gray. Mm -hmm. So, and then everything below would still be allowed, of course. Yeah. It would be allowed, but then you're losing the motivation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, could, of course, of course. You, could still claim, you could still claim that direct detection or coherent or K on the case can probe this parameter space, but to me, you're losing a big part of the motivation in this model. Yeah, but, um, so you, will, you say it would merge with the other one, but um, maybe it would even go below what we have now as the green band, this um, upper limit on the coupling. This was I, like- I don't, know. Okay, I don't know. I don't know what is going to be the, the precision on the, I mean, it is going to be more precise, right? It's been principle. But more precise, but also the central value would move. And maybe I should phrase it this way, depending, let's say the central value moves direction standard model. How does the central value of your green band move up or down? So Naively, I would say down. If you're moving towards the standard model, the yeah, you need less correction. And okay, you're, this would exclude. Lump. You're moving towards the standard model and you're still interested in. <laughs> okay. If you're moving towards the standard model, the only areas that would be consistent with your new physics would be below. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, so yeah, it moves below, but then you, would, you wouldn't have a lower bound. Yeah, yeah, no, of course not. You won't. Yeah, yeah. Would not be a band, okay? So, good. Um, if G minus two doesn't is not confirmed, I'm not working on this anymore. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Okay, other questions for David. Let me ask one more question. Uh, on page 19. There's some delay until it appears. Yeah, this one. Mm, you say, ah, look, this uh, curve that we get from the solar neutrinos would coincide exactly with the curve that we would get for a 6 GV dark matter particle, etc. Of course. Um, but this would come on top of what you expect from the background, no? So it, it would not, well, it has maybe the same shape as the background, but it would still come on top of it. Or is the uncertainty so large that you just wouldn't see it, that you need the shape I mean, See the vertical axis here is a log scale, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be twice as, yeah. I mean, what I mean is that the, a 6 GeV WIM with this cross-section would give you exactly the same spectrum 
as boronate neutrinos. Yeah. Okay. Then yes. what this means is that your neutrino floor is somewhere around that value. Now, there are different ways of drawing the neutrino floor. You can draw it when, when you start seeing neutrinos. You can also draw it when you perform a spectral analysis and you're unable to distinguish dark matter. So you could, you could actually adopt a more statistically informed way of drawing the neutrino floor and that would bring it down about an order of magnitude. For me, the way I was using it in this talk was just to point out that we will see neutrinos. That's why I chose this way of showing it. Okay. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't mean that you would be, a, I mean, statistically, you can still distinguish it. Likewise, if your dark matter particle is not 6 GeV, but 10 GeV, spectrum is slightly different. Yeah, yeah. But if you well, only you have 100 GeV below, no? then you cannot do much, okay? So you have to play there. You can do a statistical argument, okay? Oh, yeah. We haven't done it. Okay. Oh, yeah, Finding the literature. Okay. It's, Good. It's, uh, Kiran O'Hare has a very complete analysis of this neutrino floor. If you're interested. Fine. Good. I do not see any raised hand or other people popping up. Then, David, thanks again for this uh, interesting talk. Yeah, and uh, we're looking forward for the paper that you promised us within March, I believe. Huh? <laughs> we'll get back to you on this. Very good. Thanks to all of you. Okay, it's been great seeing you virtually. Yes, and we will meet again in 3D. Very soon. Yeah.